welcome to the Game Tea Time Podcast. It used to be called the Game Dev TV Podcast. We you know, changed the name, same thing, same concept, same host. So welcome on, Patrick. So if you can let the fans know a little bit about who you are, what you're up to, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, totally. Uh, great to be on, by the way. This is super fun. Um, uh, Patrick Downs, I'm a game writer. I've been writing games for, I don't know, Let's see, since like 2007, eight-ish, I guess. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the last project I worked on was uh, Ghost of Tsushima um, with Sucker Punch Productions. I mm-hmm. uh, did a few games before that, Halo, Just Cause 3. Um, and then uh, actually got my start in mobile gaming back in New York. So that was my, that's, ah. that's how I cut my teeth. Um, and before that, I had a background in film. But that's that's me. That's what I do. Well, OK, so first, let's just get started with how did you get involved with writing? Was it something like we were younger and you were like, I want to write for the rest of my life? Or was it something during high school time? Like, when did you get into writing? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I guess uh, the, the, the real answer is I was always kind of into writing. I mean, even from like when I was a little kid in first grade, I made comic books for my peers. Okay. Um, I actually. Uh, dug one up a while back and it cracked me up because I hadn't remembered this particular one but it was like it was a what what would you call it an anthology series ah okay five short stories each one had bloody in the title so it was like the bloody fight the bloody hunt the bloody adventure (laughs) oh you're so into the whole bloody (laughs) apparently I was going through a bloody phase what did I say oh you are what 14 uh, things like I a, about the age you would be like that right? <laughs> right, right. unfortunately the ripe young age of seven so for some reason oh, the blood okay. thing is really uh, present for me at that age. i don't remember if i was into bloody stuff when i was seven i know i was playing roller coaster <laughs> tycoon so right so, right that's healthier, yeah. that's healthier <laughs> hey but it led to a uh, ghost of Shima, so yeah, exactly. can't go wrong with that <laughs> exactly that's the arc uh take the long view exactly yeah that's when you said um, the comic book because it reminded me of i created a ca- capped underpants do you remember that like <laughs> i made a comic book at that one time loved it i think i made it once so i was like all right yeah comic books aren't for me and then, like never made one again <laughs> right right well like, who knows maybe you'll come back to it. you never you never know maybe we'll see <laughs> um but yeah that's that's when I, I i always wanted to kind of write in that sense and then it became um, a little older, like element, late elementary school, I got, I discovered Edgar Allan Poe, mm. which really blew my mind, first of all, because I had to sit with a dictionary and a thesaurus to, just to get through the stories and be like, what is he trying you, to say? What are you really trying to say? Uh, is yeah, it me or exactly. is it you? Exactly. And then I wrote like a bunch of horror stories where I, I definitely, every word, I went through a phase where every word I would try to replace with a, a, a multisyllabic uh oh, synonym so okay you know, every you know nobody was walking in in those stories they were always perambulating or expediting or, you know, nice right. that was that was the po phase i love uh, that you went from bloody to like then like slap you said yeah. like going that intense these are intense different uh, areas right right um and then also like my other love in life is music and so that was kind of around that time that around the time of 12 it was either going to be writing or it was going to be music or both and those were the two sort of things I pursued all through school and even through uh, undergrad um, got bitten by the film bug and that's where I kind of dipped in uh, I went to graduate school uh, in New York for film and did a little bit of that for a while and then shifted over to games but the writing was always kind of at the heart of it you know um, and I'm curious if you thought that, like, back then you would ever be doing games later on. No, you know, that's 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 uh, the funny thing, because I, I think if I went back and told seven year old Patrick, hey, man, you, you're, you're going to write games, it, it probably would have blown my mind. Um, I think at that age, it was either like. Uh, and this will date me somewhat, you know, it was either games were amazing or else I wanted to be the lead guitarist of Def Leppard. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> those, those are my Ricardo dreams. knows better than me. <laughs> I, I may or may not have been playing bass right before this interview. Right on, right on. May or may not be right there. Good man, good man. <laughs> he was preparing, he knew. Exactly. So that's awesome. So how did you get into, like, how did you get that film bug? Did somebody was like, hey, come make a film with me? Or you were like, you just saw a film, like, I want to do that? 
how that no, happened. No, it was actually a really it was it was a it was a wacky side path because what happened was um as I was pursuing music, because this was actually quite late. Like this was already I was already an undergrad in college. Okay. Um and uh and I was a, a music composition major, um, writing, you know, like basically contemporary classical music. And I started to get really into staged multimedia productions I don't know, like kind of stuff like maybe someone like laurie anderson would do you know you've mm. got like you know a, an art collage happening in the background and yeah. actors music and all this kind of stuff right so i thought well i, I need to kind of figure out i, I want to know more about how to do that stuff so i went for a summer to uh nyu and did like their video production program mm. which was really interesting because a lot of the kids that were in that class were basically film majors um because at that time everyone was kind of looking down at video like this is for this is lowly this is yeah terrible. it's the artist route yeah you know, exactly you know people exactly. feel about so they that would, right no right. money so they, would, they would take the um the video class in the summer to just kind of get it out of the way and not, mm. so i was meeting all these film kids and they were you know they they kind of were talking about all these things that i'd heard of but I really started to dive in because of it, um, uh, partly because of taking that class and, and really getting, of course, it was New York. So getting into Scorsese and Coppola and all mm. you know, the other nice New choices. York, yes. Abel Ferrara, I guess, is the other one in there. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, there was, a, there was a kid who was so horrified when I was there um, because really? I, I didn't know the difference between, I can't remember what movie it was, maybe Taxi Driver, but I didn't know the difference between Scorsese and Coppola. And he was just like, what are you, what? How is like, that, that a sin? <laughs> yeah, when you said he was horrified. I, I thought you just showed one of the bloody comics or something. <laughs> <laughs> Look, buddy. <laughs> Seven-year-old me was dangerous. <laughs> bloody everything. No, but he, he was just like, how can you? Anyway, that really, so, so all of a sudden I started to look at film with fresh eyes and really kind of dove head first into all this stuff from there you know watching the the old kind of european stuff the new wave stuff fellini uh nouvelle vague uh Godard and Truffaut and all that you know the typical film student stuff right mm -hmm. and uh it, it kind of blew my mind so i i went for a summer to figure out how to do multimedia productions and when i came back uh to to oberlin i was like oh actually i think i want to do film and that's what ended up happening then um you know, toward the tail end of my undergrad, I had fi finished up all the credits for my majors. So I had sort of a semester free and I decided to go back to NYU, but this time do an entire spring semester in the film program. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it really- Yeah, and that's where the rest is history. Is. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let me see if I can piece some of this together. So when were you, when you were doing all this, were you like doing anything on your own, like writing or doing film projects? Like how yeah, are you honing sure. your craft? Yeah, for sure. Um, writing all throughout. So, um, you know, I, you know, from the time that we were talking about when I switched from bloody subject matter to multisyllabic subject matter, <laughs> I just kept writing. I was writing short stories, you know, um, mainly. And, uh, and, and also like, even then kind of interested in the intersection between music and, and, writing and trying to figure out what to do in terms of that not just in terms of song lyrics but you know writing these sort of I wrote some kind of a I don't know what it was like a 45 minute beat poem set to music what <laughs> it's it like bigger. the old uh, version of Lofi <laughs> Lo <-fi. laughs> right, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly so there was all that stuff going on and uh and then you know and continuing into undergrad I was a creative writing minor so I continued to write like kind of quote unquote, traditional prose fiction um, yeah, all throughout school. And uh, yeah, and then once the film thing took over, it took over. Mm -hmm. uh, so these short yeah. stories, were they like, did you share them with anybody or did you post them anywhere? Or was it just for you? This, it was mostly just for me or for, you know, if it were it was classwork. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in like rural Minnesota with a population <laughs> about 2000. So that's why you didn't know the difference between Scorsese and the, yeah. all the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. So there wasn't a lot of outlets, actually. I mean, the other thing that I did is I tried desperately to get people, um, some kids to play Dungeons and Dragons in my basement, you know, and it was always like, yeah, if I really heard of them, but there was always three wheelers and snowmobiles and water skiing. And all yeah, that. it seems more fun at the moment when right, you're a kid. Right. 
So a lot of times I would just end up reading through all the the D and D manuals and making up my own adventures, like sort of by myself, you know, as, so as cool. if, and then yeah. never actually play through the campaigns. Oh. Every once in a while, I rope some people in. We have a short campaign, but then once again, they'd be, you know, off Dang. to the four wheelers again. So. If only they knew you could do that in the world. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. Oh, they missed out. But that's awesome. So that's also so that's a cool way to represent that you were also building worlds back then when you were younger, without even really knowing it, with the whole Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was such a uh and it was such a, a, a it, I don't think that in my mind I connected any of these things either. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when I was writing a short story, I was off writing a short story, and that was a thing where, you know, if I just read Raymond Carver, I'd be like, oh, let's... and then there was this thing over here, which was this game thing that I love, you know, like that. I, I still remember, like, I had the old, uh, what was it, the Demons and Demigods manual. Uh, oh, and okay. I, that thing was just torn to pieces from me paging through it constantly. Because it and all, and all, all, the, all the mythological gods and demigods and whatnot, uh, you know, uh, translated into to D&D character sheet terms. But then they'd also had, I remember they had, um, there was a series of books about a character named Elric of Melnodene that I was obsessed with. It was all about, you know, uh, I don't know if you know it, but it was like this albino prince who is very weak and, uh, and kind of, you know, uh, not physically strong himself, but he had this sword called Stormbringer that would suck souls and give him power. Ooh, that's I cool. I just remember yeah. that manual. Yeah, that manual had Elric of Melnivene and all the stats for Stormbringer in there. And it was just like, oh my God, you can do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I loved that stuff. Well, yeah, it's cool because you said so you didn't really see it at the time, but like, yeah, if you look back and piece the things that you were doing, it was 100% preparing you for what you had to do now. Weirdly, yes. Yeah, and it's almost the- like you can't really tell someone like, hey, if you want to be a writer, go do all these things. It's just like experience life, follow your passions, enjoy it, cherish them, grow your passions. Like, what's it called? Maybe water it, water the writing, water the Dungeons and Dragons moments, yeah. water the short stories. And then one day it will all come together without you even like planning on it happening. 100%. Yeah, yeah. But like, That's so important. Follow what you love, you know, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. when you're younger. You know, there's nothing you're, you're not going to uh, not be able to pay the rent when you're 12 because you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's okay. you, you have that room to experiment, too, which is really exactly I was going to say is like, so even though you might not be able to piece it together at the time, do you think there's any like advice you could give someone so that they can maybe follow it organically instead of trying to like do this like rigid thing where it's like, I got to do this because this other person did that. And that's how I'm going to become a good writer. Right. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. I think that the, the main thing, especially when you're younger, like I was saying, is, is to go where your interests take you and, and maybe don't judge them. You know, don't, uh, don't overthink how is this going to apply in my later life? Or what do I have to do? I mean, I was also doing that too on the on the guitar side. I was always very competitive and like looking at these like sixteen year old prodigies who could you know two handed tap. Yeah. You're like, like, why can't oh, I do this? I want that, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is there's a certain amount of c- competitive spirit that I think can help drive your your you know your, your learning forward, but it also can become destructive, right? Like mm. if there's no point really in comparing yourself to somebody else. Um, so the idea is always to kind of return to what, what compels you, what interests you, what you love and dig into it. Just doing it is going to make you better, right? Mm-hmm. Like just the act of doing it. And there's no replacement for doing the thing. So whether mm-hmm. it's dribbling a basketball or, you know, playing a C major scale, uh, it's the same thing. Repetition, practice, keep doing it you will naturally get better. There's any, any, I'm a firm believer that like basically any skill that another human can do, you can do. Now you may not be able to do it to the same, you know, I will never play basketball uh, to the level of Kobe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. But I can still learn the basics of basketball. Everybody can. That, that applies, whether it's writing, playing the piano, uh, you know, driving a car, everyone can get on base and then it just depends on your skill oh, like and that. your talent and your passion you know pursuing it um what yeah, happens everyone can get on base no, no quote that yeah, and, and even if you don't like pick it up 
as a career later in life, like, you'd be surprised at how it comes back later on. Like, Absolutely. Even if just helping you learn how to learn. Yeah, that, exactly. That's a great point. Exactly. It, it teaches you how to approach something, how to have discipline, how to think about something. Um, and yeah, I'm not a professional musician, but I still have, I play music like every day, you know, even if it's just a, a lot of times it yeah. just becomes a kind of meditation for me, where if I need to daydream for a sec, just grab a guitar and just noodle around while I'm thinking about something else and just kind of let, let the other stuff go, you know, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Well, that's actually very important. Like having a time and space to just like, let go, think about whatever yeah. you're thinking and no pressure on it. It's just like, I'm going to sit here with this thought and see where it takes me. You yes. never know. Like, I think the thing people get so distracted by a lot of noises that's going on around that they don't realize that, like sometimes you just do need a minute to sit down. You're not being unproductive. You're actually being productive for sitting there and sitting with this thought or playing the guitar and meditating to it or just like working out or laying down and just staring at the sky or starlit roof you have or ceiling and just like sit there and be like what is it that i really need to do what is it where do i want to go or just like let me let me see this idea the story idea and kind of like pretend that the story and be like these characters go here and there and just see where that takes you and it's okay if it doesn't take you anywhere that's fine it's that one hour was needed for you exactly exactly i think that yeah you're spot on there's so much pressure right especially mm -hmm. our day and age this the this culture you know to achieve to do to execute mm -hmm. implement uh to get out there to hustle you know um and yeah you can't you, you're gonna burn yourself out if you do that you, mm -hmm. you need to build in time for yourself um downtime you know it's it's i, I think it's essential to brain growth <laughs> you know? 100 now have you ever experienced burnout um I wouldn't call it like full on, full on burnout, but yes, mm -hmm. I've gotten real crispy. <laughs> that's that's one of the dangers too of uh, of game dev, uh, game dev, but also really any creative, demanding creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. There's there's some things there that like you know because you do have to. There are times when um, there's kind of energy and a momentum that you can't let go of. Uh, if you don't want to lose that creative edge and you have to keep pushing, but you know, you, you do have to manage it because you can get into trouble really quickly. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and so for that brief moment, you did have that like minor burnout. How did you get out of that? Did you do more meditation? Did you redirect your goals? The that that was ex that, that's exactly it. it it was a combination oh well i'll tell you the full story so like last summer uh i was pretty crispy after ghost of tsushima um the director's cut and you know this little like global plague thing we were all dealing with mm -hmm. right? so i had actually the way i had dealt kind of just trying to push my way through it i was literally ordering like uber eats three times a day you know like just blah. Yeah. Um, there. I got yeah I pushed up I, at my max um I was about I'm, I'm about 160 now I was up at 250 uh whoa the the what oh, yeah congrats so, to getting back yeah. down yeah. <laughs> right um and so yeah that's how I was dealing with it unhealthily and then you know kind of I had a moment of like buddy what are you, what are you doing here like you just tried <laughs> to walk for a mile and you're like out of breath and your ankles hurt and it was like, nah, come on. So it was just like wow. reset, recognize oh. that this is a thing and just start to eat healthy and little by little more and more exercise. And I really think that those, the, the thing about, uh, there's, it's not rocket science, how to avoid burnout. Mm -hmm. It's about taking care of the simple, basic things like that. Like making sure you have enough exercise or physical activity, eating you know, not whatever garbage is in front of you, but what, what's going to, you know, eat your chicken and vegetables. Right? There you go. Yes. Good for yourself, right? <laughs> um, and it's really about those little things. Get enough sleep. It's, it's not, it, it, does, it doesn't take Einstein, but, you know, you just need to be able to, to, to recognize the value of that and follow through on it. And, uh, yeah, so. Um, wow. That's, yeah. An, that's an intense. I like, though, the reset and uh, recognize. So it's like, okay, take a minute to reset. It's all right. What happened that was in the past it's time to move forward and then just recognize that it was happening because that's yep. the first thing right be self-aware hey i'm having this problem boom and now you have to you're already done half the work 
Now you just got to go and like fix that, which is awesome because there are moments too when I felt like, oh, hey, like I'm doing a lot of work, work, work. And then I, instead of resetting, I'm like, let me go do more work because I don't want to feel bad about like relaxing. And it's like, okay, hold on. We need to recognize this is not good. Let me right. take it back. And then when you do rest, you come back, you're stronger than ever. You can go and take those like five, six college classes and be like, oh, let's go. Let's after it. But you do need that moment of rest. And I think it's hard when you hear hustle, grind, get after it. You could do this sacrifice now for later and it's like yeah but if i sacrifice now and then i'm not healthy later what was the point yep so. exactly that's what's so destructive about you know hustle culture is exactly that no you can't pin the needle into the red uh at you know 10,000 rpm every day week after week month after month you're you're gonna something's gonna fail and fall apart you need to pace yourself mm -hmm. um and that's really, I think, the key is how to stay energized and interested and also build in time to take it down a notch, mm -hmm. right? Recover, rest. It's, it's essential. Mm -hmm. so. Beautiful. Right, so let's get back into the, the film school. So did you do a lot of writing there in film or was it more of just like the creative part of filming? Uh, Which, yeah, what? it was writing and directing were my, okay, my cool. two big things. So what happened there is, um, you know, in the, the film, the, the program at Columbia kind of has a, a particular uh, focus or did at the time where, you know, you, you come out with sort of year one, a, a major short film project, and then year two, a major short film project, and then your thesis film, if you're directing or mm -hmm. thesis screenplay, if you're a pure writer. And I was very much interested in kind of the, the writer director path. So um, uh, I came out of there with a short film that did really well at festivals, won a bunch of awards, made me like, uh, you know, hot little junior filmmaker hey. for about five minutes. You know, Sundance? Like fasting and rewards. Like, yeah. Oh, star. Uh, but it was fun. It was super fun. And then, you know, uh, you, you get through that first phase and then it's, the, you know, the real work starts. Um, and so for a while, I was kind of kicking around indie film circles in New York, uh, doing short films had projects that would get set up and then not go through. Um, but little things, you know, I sold something to Sony uh, Screen Gems a while back, um, never got made under the, under the kind of guise that I wrote it, but a mm -hmm. version of it eventually came out. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of worked in that space for a while. And yeah. what happened was literally um, around like 2007, 2008, there was a big writer strike. And so everything shut down, you, you know, like, and, and really the timing for me personally sucked because I had pitches out to some fairly uh, interesting players. And it was something like, we, you can continue to work, but I can't read it. So sorry. And then we'll pick this back up once the strike is over. Oh, no. So at that, around that time, a friend of mine reached out and said, hey, uh, I'm working for this uh, game developer. Um, they do mobile games. And I was like, mobile games? What the hell is that? Because um, this was early days. This was like yeah. the start of the first iPhone, right? And uh, she said, you know, they're, they're looking for a writer. And I was like, cool, let's, let's do this. Um, and that, that was Gameloft. And I started working there. And that's really where I, uh, in Gameloft in New York, is where I started to kind of return to my earlier interest in games now you know many years later after doing film after doing other stuff and uh it was it was an, it was fascinating i got more and more pulled into that side of things to the point that like once the writer's strike lifted i was still kind of working on things mm -hmm. you know there was a point where i was at game loft but i was also I, I had to go and do location scouting in egypt for three weeks because oh that's cool that's, yeah uh, but uh but more and more and more and more the game thing took over and then at a certain point probably around the time that i worked on just cause three that was when i went okay i think i think this is the thing i'm gonna do this and you're like this is it i made yeah. it <laughs> now i'm also curious really quick did you play games during all this like time that was happening like going to yeah, school you, working on the films you know it's it's i did when i was little you know like mm -hmm. a kid and then I started to kind of drift away from, from gaming in, in any sense until mm -hmm. um, almost like after high school. And then, you know, um, this will date me, but like then certain things like Silent Hill really pulled me back in. I was like, what is this? You know, I had a friend <laughs> who was like play, obsessed with this game and then he showed it to me and I was like, oh my like, God. Oh, yeah. What's going on here? Um, 
but then what really kind of started to pique my interest again was um Halo, the first Halo to a certain extent, but not even really there. It was a little bit later with Bioware stuff. And Ooh, okay. when they started, you know, when Dragon Age and the first Dragon Age, the first Mass Effect, those things start to pop. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the first two. Bioshock around mm-hmm. that time, it was like, oh, what's going on over here? GTA 3 and 4. GTA um, 4 that's was amazing. Started, yeah, it was incredible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really what pulled me back into gaming hard. And then it was like, yeah, this this wow what have, what have i been missing out on <laughs> now i'm curious so when you deciding to write for games do you feel like you have to like go and play certain games to be like hey, this is how the story is structured this is the way the dialogue goes in because it's completely different from a movie because there's multiple choices and some of them you might never see so i was yeah. wondering like did you try to use games as a way to help you write or you were just like i'm now writing differently i'm gonna go this route and like share right. this and see if it's what they wanted Right. I mean, yeah, they are extremely different. I think there are there are certain crossovers um, mm-hmm. because obviously, like in, in terms of all writing, like if you're talking about uh, character, drama, conflict, all these things, you know, are are shared across media, whether it's you know interactive and gaming or linear like film or or prose fiction, right? Um, but the the at a certain point, you just in writing for a player becomes a different activity and skill set right you're you're writing for a story that is meant to be played not meant to be consumed uh you know in one go Mm -hmm. so that really started to call upon then then i was really just developing a different skill set and a different set of muscles and that's what kind of drew me in i still you know in particular we always complain right everybody the 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 kind of the constant mantra is cut scenes why do we why do we have them we shouldn't have them we should have them we should skip them we can't skip them um <laughs> I you know, still it, that. <laughs> yeah you know it's like this, i love cut scenes <laughs> it's right <laughs> right they're good they're fun they're great um, it, you know and and at a certain point i think like i i uh understand the debate and the issues around this kind of thing or anytime you're taking your your uh you know, off the sticks, your hands off the sticks, but we've been using them for 20 years now. So they're clearly useful Mm -hmm. as a storytelling device in some way, some way or another, 20, 30 years, maybe more. Um, So I find that sort of training. Yeah, exactly. And the, that sort of scene work still is very much, I I bring out my, my screenplay writing Mm -hmm. toolbox when I'm working on that stuff as a direct relationship. Right. But other stuff. Yeah. It's a different approach. Um, uh, and you just have to learn by doing and by playing, basically. Um, it's almost like there's a one way to look at it in a way is that a screenplay represents some a, a, a subset, a very specific subset of possible narrative design choices, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a it's like a, a one, you know linear and it works in this way. Exactly. When you start to work in games, you start to realize that like yeah, there's narrative design. Uh, involved in in screenwriting mm-hmm. but it's it's like you're looking through a tiny you know like one little piece of it <laughs> yeah. narrative design is actually it's this like yo this all of this you're right like um that's a lot <laughs> right. i have to make it all compelling right exactly mm-hmm. which is the fun and what's so exciting about writing for games right it's mm-hmm. it's not just the kind of the the critical path um golden path storyline with this you know the set pieces and, and the you know fancy cut scenes it's also the little moments in fact more so the little moments right like uh what like uh josh share was talking about something from from um one of Ghost? the uncharted oh, early uncharted. Days and like so you know uh he's Nate drake's getting marched through a prison and uh the 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 guard says go left and if the player goes right he says your other left which is such a tiny little moment but Mm -hmm. if you you know that kind of micro reactivity if you get that uh a hundred times in the game the game starts to feel responsive to you and alive and the world Mm -hmm. starts to feel alive in a way that's really it is unique to games that you don't get in any other medium and that's the stuff that's like that's the juice right that's Mm -hmm. that's that moment right there's why i love games i love the I'm in this world and it's reacting to every move I make. And it's not because like, I mean, back then it was harder, it was more restrictive. But nowadays it's like with all the technology we have, we can make these games so interactive. 
that it almost feels like real life. And I'm like, that's that's what I want. I want to like yeah. go into this world. It's like traveling to another planet. I'm going to drop into this world and interact, or it's like time traveling, like going to ghosts, going back in time and seeing what it was like dealing with this whole Mongol invasion. And yeah. it's like this is it this is like our time travel this is our way to experience different lives and i i don't i can't get that from other mediums sure it's like a movie yeah. you can kind of like follow the character but the fact that you can now interact with this world and i've, I've always had this conversation where i'm like i feel like when games get better at decision making like kind of like the witcher 3 does with the whole morality choices you can start to like learn how to be empathetic you can learn you can start to reflect your moral choices and that, to me, I think is going to be the greatest thing the games could do later on, where it's like, was that the right choice you made? I don't know. I guess you'll find out as the game progresses. Right, right. So, yeah. Well, I wonder if actually you have any moments where you're writing, you're like, hey, I'm trying to write this in a way to, like, inspire someone or makes them challenge their, like, their mor- morals or... I wonder if you have those moments. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, in a way, that's both what I'm always trying to do and mm. what I'm, I'm rarely um, consciously doing. I mean, on uh, some okay. level, uh, I want everything I write to be um, interesting, challenging, um, doing something with your expectations, giving you something to, to kind of chew on. Um, so th- I feel like that's, and, and really that's a part of writing character well because i think if you write for character you're mm-hmm. writing for real human beings at least in your head right mm-hmm. no, and I real human that. beings are always going to be multi-dimensional and have unexpected things about them and have um do things that are disappointing and things that are inspirational and the same person can do both you know mm-hmm. back to back kind of a thing and once you start to think about it in those terms um you can't help but write stuff that's going to be challenging whether from uh, the standpoint of, of, of morality or aesthetics or you know uh, something because real people are challenging in that way right mm-hmm. um, so i always try that's 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 my own thing is just if i can infuse humanity uh into a game then then i feel like that's the other stuff is going to come with it naturally mm-hmm is a part of being human 100 percent. and now when you're trying to do this is it coming from personal experiences external experiences both like how do you really capture the true human condition without it seem like one-dimensional like oh yeah this is the archetype of this character this person's always mad at the bad leader or this person's yeah. always nice and caring like how do you how do you build yeah. a three-dimensional character yeah I, I you put your finger on it right because the thing you don't want to write is is you the thing you don't want to say to yourself is i'm going to write about the human condition you're going to blow yourself up <laughs> it's gonna be like oh god what is that <laughs> right <laughs> uh, <laughs> to go learn <laughs> about everyone's guard real story. quick you know? uh you know so it becomes more about who who is this person um why are they you know why are they doing this thing that i come upon them that they're doing why do they want the things that they want uh what happened to them in their past to 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 make them feel and act the way they are right now what's their favorite meal why you know the Mm -hmm. more you get into the specificity of it like who is this person not writ large not even an archetype archetypes are useful in another way uh you know to set up sort of broad outlines for the player to understand and track and for developers to understand and track but specifics who is Mm -hmm. this person how what word do they constantly use you know uh all of those little ticks and behaviors and likes and dislikes start to accumulate and then they start to feel real um the real trick is of course you can go too far in that direction you know, oh, like yeah. at a certain point, like, uh, you know, what is this character's, this character's favorite color is blue. Uh, does it matter? I don't know. Uh, you know, so, it, and that can, uh, like sometimes you, if you go too far in that direction, it can start to deceive you and you think that like, oh, I'm weaving this web of reality. Yeah. It's really got a, a collection of. Uh, and it overwhelms you the details. Tales. Right. Yeah. So you always want to, you know, the, 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 the other thing to balance it, to return to is what is the story I'm trying to tell? What is it really? What do I think it's about? It's usually not about what I think it is, but I at least have an operating idea that okay, this is this is 
Got it. Right. This is a story about power and control. So how does this relate to power and control in this moment? Da, 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 da. And you steer toward that and that becomes your guidepost. And then the kind of the push pull is, but who is this person? Who, who are they really? How, what are they like outside the frame of this story? Um, so it's kind of both and. I don't know if that makes sense, but no, I get the yeah. back and forth, you know. And then how do you prevent yourself from writing a character who sounds like the other character you just wrote? Because like whenever I've written characters, I'm like, they, they're like the same, but they're yeah. different in my head. It's just like, how do you get that on paper? Yeah, yeah, that's another great question. I mean, again, like thinking about voice, um, partly it comes from just, again, grounding yourself in who is this person specifically. But there are also, you know, there's, there's craft uh, involved in that and, and kind of a bag of tricks. So for instance, um, there was, just to, to tip, pull an example out randomly out of a hat, um, there was a character in uh, uh, Halo 5 that we wanted, the, the idea was that she was kind of, she was an engineer and her kind of worldview was all about objects and things and spaces and less so about people. Like she was just, so in order to capture that in the language, we made a rule for ourselves that she doesn't use pronouns and she barely, rarely uses, you know, she oh, okay. so we find ways not to, for her to say things without using direct pronouns or names or that sort of thing. And that was just a rule. So we just put that in the ground let's try this. Um, it immediately dialed us into a certain kind of voice. Then from there, you start to shape it and make more nuance out of it. But oftentimes like just doing those kinds of things, you know, what is the, a, a rule about who they are and how that translates into language, a rule about the sorts of things they will talk about or won't talk about, a rule about um, this is the lie this person tells themselves and this is how it comes out in the language. Um, all of those things you, you, you start to dial into a voice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the voice just hits you, you know, it's just something like, like that's, some, yeah. you know, it's sort of a, a secret alchemy. Like I know in my head, this is my grandma and my cousin and I'm going to write it like my grandma and my cousin. And it feels real, you know, like it was oh, all kinds that's of that's genius. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All the time, all the time. Usually, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I draw on people I know or have met all the time. Mm -hmm. Little ticks. Uh, and then when it comes to writing like in a team, how do you guys all man like how do you guys develop a character? Is it mm -hmm. over time you're like throwing ideas and you're like, this is the character, this is our voice, this is what speaks to us? Or is it, like someone like comes up with one, is, like this is the character, someone else comes with it, and you're like, which one do you like more? Because yeah. that always just seems like hard where like a whole team of writers coming together saying, Okay, this is the character, and this is the character, right. and this is the right. yeah. Right. Yeah, it is it's 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 a mysterious process in a way because you're all just it, it, there's really no it, it's just the people in the room and also not just writers right like you mm -hmm. also you know artists are going to bring ideas about how they want the character their idea of the character how they look how they behave how they talk or you know uh designers will have ideas uh, obviously the creative directors and game di directors have ideas uh so you're in this <laughs> you're this whole mix right it's not just the writers although generally you know this is an area that writers narrative tends to own so you're getting ideas from all kinds of places and you just start to, it's that mysterious thing that happens when you collaborate. It's like somebody says something that unlocks an idea. I'll tell you, I'll give you a great example, actually. Um, just to just to illustrate like one small way this, this process works. Um, I, I wrote a character for Ghost of Tsushima called Yuriko, who is kind of an older woman who's mm -hmm. kind of a surrogate uh, mother figure to, to Jin Sakai, the protagonist, right? And, um, you know, I had, I, and, and the way we worked is, is a lot of times like one writer would own a character. Um, sometimes that would be shared out. And obviously like, if you're talking about like the, the player character, everybody is writing for that character. Mm -hmm. But in certain cases, like we would own individual characters and Yuriko is my character, but I still would, you know, get feedback and, blah, 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 and all this. And, um, Shoot, I just realized I'm probably going to, I have a pretty big spoiler, so I'm going to try and talk around the spoiler if I can. If you, if you know the character, you know what I'm talking about. There's a certain very significant fact about her that becomes more and more clear as you play her storyline. Um, that wasn't originally in the conception of the character. It was it was about the, 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 the writing was all about like her relationship to Jin and 
Um, and, and she could be a kind of a, a, a repository of memories that would tell us more about who Jin was before he reached this point. And that was going to mm-hmm. be the primary interest there, right? But it wasn't quite clicking, right? Like it was good. There was some lovely moments and stuff and, you know, good, good things happening. But it, was, it just, there was something missing. And, uh, and that's when just kind of kicking, talking about this in particular with, with my lead writer, um, we were both huge fans of a BoJack episode. See, I can't spoil it that way either. There's a certain BoJack episode where <laughs> a certain topic comes up that's a mm. brilliant episode. <laughs> and he mentioned it, and it sort of went, oh. like, that's the thing. That's what it is. Uh, she's, un- she's experiencing this certain thing that I won't mention. <laughs> it's like the worst interview yeah. ever. No, I've, been no, five, I've, been, I've been listening to you talk for five minutes. I have no idea what you're talking about, dude. Like, <laughs> if you no, no, play good. to Tushma, maybe you'll know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, and once I had that idea for her, uh, everything else unlocked beautifully. And, it, and literally, it was like that. It was like it, all these things that were kind of working at 90% or 70% even, suddenly clicked to 100. Uh, So that's sort of the, that's, that's just one small example. That happens all the time. You know, Um, Mm -hmm. that was a dramatic example, but we, you know, you have a conception of a character, another writer comes in with an idea that's never occurred to you before. You're like, oh my God, you run with that. You might run with it and then realize "Mm, that's not going somewhere. And then you, you turn back around and go somewhere else. It's just that constant feedback that eventually a, a character emerges, right? You told me if I had to be a good writer, I got to watch BoJack episodes and all. all <laughs> well, it, it is a good start. It's a great yeah, show. It can't hurt. It definitely can't hurt. But no, like that's like, I guess, counterintuitive to what people would think is like, especially with this hustle culture. I think that's the danger of hustle culture. But it's like, nope, TV bad. Got to just write all the time. But it's like, maybe you have a balance of it. You get inspiration from some TV shows and then you go write a ton. And you get that moment where it's like, I'm confused. Oh, boom. That one yeah. moment in that one show might help us figure this out right here. Yeah. It's like yeah. in Bojack when he tries to write the book and nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I, we've, we've established it. Bojack is actually the Bible for all writers. <laughs> Any problem you have, Bojack has a solution. <laughs> Perfection. But yeah, so that, that um, I think you posted in your LinkedIn, right? The All the Yurko Tales. Yurko Tales. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was like watching some of it and I was looking at the comments. Everybody was like, I didn't know I would cry or I didn't know this would happen. I don't know. Like this was too wholesome. I love this. And I was like, dang, you really, you really killed it with these um, <laughs> missions. And then I realized as I was watching, I was like, oh, I did some of these. And these were some of my favorite missions. And I was like, yeah, like, and I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you get to the point where you feel very confident in your writing, where you start to write some of these things that people really connect with and resonate with? Mm. Well, um, the, the real answer is you never know. You don't know. You have a better, you develop enough of a, a pra- with practice, mm-hmm. you develop enough craft where you at least know uh, when you write something that you're going to, you know, you're going to hit a base hit, you know, mm-hmm. or you're, you're not going to strike out or you're rarely going to strike out. You know, mm-hmm. you can get it to that level. After that, I don't know. I poured as much love into and, and hard, probably more actually, if we're talking just like pure blood, sweat, and tears into, uh, you know, the character of Norio as I did Yuriko. Norio is a lovely character. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people are fans, but it didn't hit in quite the way that that, the, the Yuriko storyline hit. It wasn't anything, you know, I, I pour, it wasn't because I worked harder on one or the other. I poured everything I had into, into both. <laughs> Uh, you, sometimes you just don't know. Sometimes something comes together. Sometimes you, you, you know, you hit a B minus, sometimes you hit an A plus, you know, all I know is I know how to get it so that the thing works. Uh, Okay. And after that, it's gosh, who knows? Yeah. So it's just kind of like, just, you know, do your best and just share it with the world and see what happens. Cause there's always like, I could write better. It could be more perfect. It could this and that. And it's like, sometimes you just got to let it send it and see what happens. Yep, exactly. And, and also, um, it's, I, I think it's important, actually, to not think about that when you're doing it, too, because that can be another kind of weird head, you know, weird voice in your head saying, like, mm, people aren't going to like this as much as this other one, you know, and then you're just going to get in your own way. You have to kind of let it go. And also understand that, um, you know, how many things have people created 
uh, not just writing now we're talking, where when it first came out, nobody got it. And you're like, what the fuck? And then 20 years later, it's like uh, the biggest it's, thing it's, everyone loves. Your best them. thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that happens so often that at a certain point, you just got to be like, yeah, it's, it's, there's no control over this. What I love to do is make the world, make the thing and give it to people, but I'm not going to prejudge how they're going to respond to it, whether they're going to like it or not like it. That's, that's not my job. Mm. I'm just going to do the thing, you know? Gotcha. Okay. I'm curious, what is like the writing process for someone working on a AAA game like Ghost of Shima? Is it like an all day thing? Like how, how much work you put into it every day? Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, well, you know, I usually just uh, go on autopilot to uh, take a long nap around lunch. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it depends on what phase of the project you're on, you know, for sure. You know, there's, there's an early phase in a game. If you're, if you're in that situation, you're not always in that situation as a writer where you're coming up with like the, 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 the basis of the game you know, the, the very early stages of like, what is this game? And what's it about? And all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that feels different from later things because there you're just, it's professional daydreaming, right? You're trying to think like, you know, blue sky, what do we want to do here? Mm-hmm. Um, start to put a few stakes in the ground, start to get some, some kind of pillars that you can refer to that, you know, feel right for, for the project. Um, at a certain point, as you start to move more and more into writing and, um, specific things and move more and more toward hard deadlines, um, the, the, the process shifts. It becomes more intense and focused. And by the way, I like both. Like I love the daydreaming uh, phase, the ideation phase. Um, and, and that has a certain amount of pleasure just thinking about all the possibilities, imagining, you know, what if, saying what if a lot. Then as you get focused, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of an adrenaline, for me anyway, uh, thing where it's like, yeah, now we got to hit this. I got to, I got to get this thing out. We got to record it with the actors. We got to go, go, go. Uh, and that tends to like really focus your energies. And that's also, I think that phase is where things really start to cook. Because at a certain point, you know, you can imagine anything. and Maybe it could work and it's all theoretical until it starts to happen. And once mm-hmm. things starts to get made, I can feel the thing coming to life. I just want to, you know, then I just, I, I want to get in there and make it better, and make it good and just keep working on it, keep chewing that bone until it gets exactly the way I want it to be. Um, to mix metaphor, chewing that bone until it gets what I want it to be. That's weird. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you might be hungry. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stream of consciousness. Here. <laughs> Um, and, and that becomes then the thing, uh, and it's, uh, you know, that phase is also incredibly enjoyable. So it depends on which phase of pre-production production production you're in, uh, in terms of like what the writer's day-to-day feels like. Um, but you know, and then it's a mix of, you have your private writing time and then you have all of the collaboration time with other writers, with other departments, that sort of thing. And that rhythm of going back and forth. Uh, between those two things is also I find very fulfilling like that's partly why I'm in this medium it's Mm -hmm. also what drew me to film too is that the collaborative aspect of it you know getting getting, saying something doing something that spark you see the spark happen in somebody else and they take the ball and run with it I love that stuff Mm -hmm. Uh, that sounds awesome and then when you're working with people like that how do you actually know when you were mentioning earlier about like you're chewing on a bone how do you know that it's like really good do you share with someone say hey like does this does this catch you or you just reading and you're like no it could be better this way or, or i could add this to that like, how yeah. do you make that into the the bone that you want uh, <laughs> thank you for pursuing this half yeah. let's, let's just do this for the rest of the time we'll call the episode uh the chewed bone it, no one i, I can do it what Chewed bone stuff. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Um, it's it's the, the answer is all, all of the above, right? Like there are times when I know what I'm after and I'm not getting it, and I want to, and I try different things, and I'm, I'm pushing myself alone to get to the thing. Um, it's also incredibly helpful to get uh, another pair of eyes, right? Um, writer eyes because they know they understand the process better than anyone else on the team, right? So they can they they those are your collaborators who instantly get what you're trying to do. 
um, usually, or have a good sense for it anyway. And their feedback is invaluable. The, also, the I think in addition to writers, your most important narrative feedback collaborators, and unfortunately it happens at a, 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 by necessity at a later stage, is your actors. Your actors will always tell you. Whether they tell you explicitly or not, they're telling you all the time what makes sense about the scene, what doesn't, what, what works about this dialogue, what doesn't. And I think talking to them, asking them questions, soliciting their ideas is hugely important for me. Um, definitely not one of those writers who's like, no, do it this way. I have this thing in my head. You must do it, you know, reproduce it, please. Absolutely not. Actors are, are immensely talented, creative professionals and collaborators. And you, uh, you will learn so much by just being open to their feedback. For sure. You know, as the writers, you get to choose the actors you get on the, on the team or is that uh, a different department yeah it's it's a shared like so many things it's a shared responsibility and Mm -hmm. it it also varies from studio to studio a little bit you know like how uh, obviously writers are very involved in and in pieces of the casting process particularly if they are you know they have a a large role to play in writing those characters um but it's it's always a a shared responsibility um game director you know directors uh often have a big stake in that um the cinematics people of course uh have a huge stake in that um so it varies but yeah you do you get to choose the the thing where you know what often happens in the game especially larger games with a large cast is you're you're more involved in that kind of primary cast selection process a lot of times for the you know filling out the cast with tertiary roles you're just going to get people who can knock it out of the park that you know and you know and production knows and you just bring them in and you may not be as you know kind of uh, involved to a granular level mm-hmm. casting those types of roles, but certainly with the primary cast, uh, you, you are. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking like maybe you, maybe the way that you wrote it, you're like this person, the way they speak is going to fit the way I wrote it better than maybe someone else, but maybe someone else might come and bring something new that I can change my writing. So I didn't know if it really in depth with that picking the actor process. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, and, and that's the thing, like sometimes I will have uh, an actor in mind, even if we're not going to cast them, but just mm-hmm. to kind of, again, going back to the, you know, how do you find the voice of a particular character? Sometimes it's very easy to, you know, it may, well, I'll tell you one. Uh, I'll tell you another one. Uh, the character I wrote called uh, Sensei Ishikawa. Hey. Uh, I, was, I, I was working with a kind of, you know, like, very different sorts of ideas about who this character could be and, and kind of trying to find the voice. And then I heard Francois Chow and I went, who has a very distinctive voice. And I went, oh, that's the character. Mm-hmm. And like that, the voice snapped for me. And so uh, thank you, Francois, wherever you are. <laughs> out there. Because that was really like, I heard you know, that voice went like, aha, I've got the guy um you're not always that lucky sometimes you uh you know you have to search for it uh, in other ways um but yeah that's one very strong example what was your original question it was about the casting uh it was more common on what you were you answered okay but yeah. um but then i kind of wanted to ask something about the sh- sh- uh, whole like show don't tell how do you incorporate that when it comes to writing for games because that uh, seems well, a little harder since there's a lot yeah. of that goes into the level design and gameplay mechanics yeah yeah I mean, if there's a rule, it's uh, I play don't tell. Um, oh, okay. That's not always uh, possible, mm-hmm. um, but you know, as much as possible as, as you can, play don't tell. Um, if it, you know, can you play through it? Let's let's make sure you can. For moments that we really we need to control an author, there's our cutscenes and our other kinds of vignettes and things where it's partially off the sticks or entirely off the sticks. But in general, that's the that's rule. Also. <laughs> I'm going to get really into the weeds for a second. Oh, let's here. do it. Um, there's, uh, well, show don't tell as a mantra, I think is often abused, like so many mantras. It's kind of a good advice, but I can give you a, a thousand examples of wonderful scenes, film, television, every medium where tell don't show is what happened and it, it worked brilliantly. So that would be like my first thing. It's like show don't tell isn't always the case. Uh, you know, 
regardless of what you, what you feel about Aaron Sorkin, he's a big tell don't show guy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he flips that on his head and he's done all right. You know, he's had no cake for um, the other thing. Sorry, you got me on my soapbox now and I'm just going to, I'm just going to spew this out. The it's other thing good. that you hear a lot is in addition to, to show don't tell is write what you know. And that's another one that drives me crazy. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, right, what, you've heard this, right? Like, write what you know, write from your experience, right? Right, you know, right. I don't, silly, not in that way, but I get where it's coming from. Because like, if you don't know, you can't write about it. But then, like, you can't know everything in the world. Exactly. So here's here's the thing. The uh, the the phrase came from an essay by Henry James called "The Art of Fiction," and it's an example in which he was talking about. Uh, about his his good friend Edith Wharton, mm -hmm. who was also a brilliant writer, and what he was talking about specifically was Edith, and we're talking you know like nineteenth century, right? So back yeah. in the day, bit uh, she had written a story in which there was a scene with some uh, French uh, boys and young men, kind of in a in a uh, salon type, you know, the cigar room, and it was mm. it was spot on, like it was a brilliantly written scene. And he was talking about like how did Edith Wharton, how did she know this word French Protestant? Yeah. Then like, all this, you know, mm -hmm. you know, all of this. And what he said was, and I'm even going to paraphrase him because it's Henry James, so you know, this would be like a uh, take me five minutes just to say one sentence. But to paraphrase him, what he said was, write what you know, but be sure to strive to be one upon whom nothing is lost. In other words, oh. know everything. Or at least try to. Mm -hmm. So that's the other half of it. Well, that's overwhelming. That's right what you know. <laughs> but the job of a writer is to know as much as possible mm -hmm. about the thing you're writing about. Do whatever you have to do. Absorb it through life, through inference, through research, whatever it is. Expand the circumference of what you know and your writing will become richer, right? Yeah. Anyway, soapbox uh, rant over. <laughs> well, that was beautiful. But I think because uh, it takes a little bit of experience to follow the rules and a lot of experience to know when to break them, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. In, in every, I mean, that, that applies whether you're playing jazz or writing a short story or a game or, you know, uh, driving in NASCAR. You, you get a certain amount of experience and you start to know when to break the rules, right? Uh, so don't break the rules right away, even if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Give it some time, learn the yeah. craft. But uh, awesome, okay. Sure. Well, uh, looks like we're about uh, almost four, so I'll start wrapping it up. And at the cool. end, I like to uh, ask the guests to do a challenge for the uh, listeners. So if you can come up with a challenge, it could be anything related to writing, game, music, whatever you're feeling. So yeah, so uh, let's see if you got a challenge for all the listeners. A challenge? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to lay down a challenge here. Um, what? What? Wow. Well, uh, I guess we want something more on topic than like uh, bake a souffle before Friday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could, <laughs> but like it probably wouldn't be. It'd be maybe. like, well, I mean, maybe if I'm gonna write about making a souffle or somebody has a souffle in the story, then yeah. Right. Well, that's how uh, they get the chewed bone. They can get <laughs> they can chew, for the recipe. Chew a bone for the week. <laughs> for the weekend is over. Chew a bone. There you go. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what would be a good challenge? Gosh. Well, here's a, this is probably not as fun as like a challenge, but here's a, a nice, for the writers in the audience who want to work on craft, here's a nice, I also taught writing uh, periodically, and this is one that I really like. Um, take some time, like let's say in the next week, write about someone you know. Write about something that really happened to them, but tell the story in such a way that uh, if I knew who you're writing about, I would, without hearing their name or anything, knowing anything about them uh, other than what happened in the story, I say, oh my God, that is so, uh, that is so KD. That is, that is exactly what he's like. I, I, I can picture that it's, it's exactly him. And that's my reaction is like, yup, that's that person. Um, so yeah, write a story, a brief anecdote. I don't really want to call it a story because it can be like a couple paragraphs, but write it so that Anybody who knows that person instantly recognizes that it's them. I think it's a really good Simple challenge. Character. Yeah. It almost made me start thinking, like, what if I somebody started recreating stories, but with, like, instead of the main character being what someone wrote already, just add, like, someone you know. 
Like, oh, what if my friend was in this story and said, how would they react to the circumstances and stuff? That's and great. Then, yeah. Let's, so. make that a, let's make that a secondary challenge. If anyone okay. take a story that's already been written, put your own character in that based on someone you know, and how does the story change? That's pretty good. Hey, I think, yeah, I just thought I was like, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, okay. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, Patrick. This has been amazing. I learned so much. Yeah. Definitely know we never to always use show don't tell. It's uh it's not always good. <laughs> it's play don't tell. <laughs> and then uh, this episode is gonna be called the screwed bone or the chewed bone. <laughs> but yeah, but uh thanks for coming on. And I like to do it at the end and just pass the mic to you to do any last minute shout outs, uh anything you want to uh, let the listeners know. And uh thanks for coming on, and the mic's all yours. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been super fun. I don't know what, what should we do? We got to let's, uh, what, uh, everybody share this with your friends. Let's, let's boost yes. the subscriber rate. Let's get some views and clicks, right? Like, mm -hmm. there you go. Yes. Killing me. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to KB on Twitter, you know, shout out to Ricardo. Let's do this thing. I want, uh, a thousand views in the first hour when this thing goes up. All like, right. Let's make it happen. <laughs> thousand two thousand ten thousand let's go Third challenge that's the other <laughs> it's challenge. the other challenge <laughs>